I remember John Littlewood saying to me one day when I was down in London and when Skiffle was beginning, Lonnie Donegan and other Rock Island line, and they, I think those of us in the folk of Myville realised immediately the importance of Skiffle. It was youngsters beginning to make their own music. And once they begin to make their own music, some of them would be searching for better music to make. And this is what happened. We used to make little jokes about the three chord trick. But it meant that kids, young folk, could make music easily. And the songs they were looking for and using were good songs. American at first, but later on being introduced to their own British songs, particularly on my end, Scottish. And also songwriters like Ewan developing. It tied up with the anti-nuclear movement. You couldn't have a demonstration without young people with guitars and singing. And I remember Joan saying to me once that uh, because she was getting worried about you and drifting towards song and away from the theatre. And she said, you know, Norman, Ewan said to me with his, his, his eyes a gleam, saying, did I realise there were 300 skiffle groups in London now? And I said, well, that's good. <laughs> but uh, I realised why Ewan felt it was good. But Joan didn't quite, I think, at that point understand that. She felt he should still be on theatre. So he was involved with youngsters making the music in that kind of way. He knew what he was doing very much, you know. Skiffle was do-it-yourself music. And the fact that it was American made it more easily accessible because it was quite like the pop music they were hearing. The folk revival, I would have said, began proper when Ewan and Bert and Alan started talking about British folk music, about there being music that was indigenous to hear and the importance of singing your own folk music as part of your own roots. McCall had always regarded traditional music as an ideal and flexible vehicle for a contemporary message. Now, he and Seeger combined their songs with his theatrical and broadcasting experience to reach an audience far wider than any theatre could provide. Within two years, they were working on their most ambitious project, the documentary Radio Ballads. The commission for the Radio Ballads came from the Radio Features Department of the BBC, a small but influential group of radical broadcasters who since the 1930s had given a platform to artists like W.H. Auden, Benjamin Britten and Louis McNeese. McCall was approached by producer Charles Parker to write a script about an engine driver called John Axon. Axon had sacrificed his life trying to save a doomed train as it ran out of control. The then Director General of the BBC, Sir Hugh Green, described the ballad of John Axon as the most originally conceived, most brilliantly executed, and most moving radio program I have ever heard. We present The Ballad of John Axon, the real life story of a railwayman told by the men who knew him and worked with him and set into song by Ewan McCall. The year was 1957, the morning bright and gay. On the 9th of February, John Axon drove away. In Charles Parker came to Ewan with the idea for doing John Axon. He wanted to do a Casey Jones story. Certainly in the BBC, you recorded um, farmers and miners and what were called field speakers and informants, but you never used what they gave you live. And I do know that we were among the first people to do that, to actually use the sound of the person you'd recorded, not just taking it down on paper, then getting an actor to read it. Engine driver's got to be in the blood for a start. If it's not in your blood to stand the erratic hours, you'll never stand the pace. You see, as a young lad at 15 years of age, you're prepared for all this. And uh, the railway life, to my mind, to the proper railwoman, it always comes first. Well, I started when I was, well, I was just turned 14 when I started. You just went to your work with your, your chuck under your arm and that was that, you were brought up to it. Uh, and uh, that's why today you'll get the, the, the proper driver, he thinks nothing of going to London and booking off because railways, it, it's in his blood. The old railwayman, it was a tradition, it was part of your life. It went through, railways went through the back of your spine like Blackpool went through rock. There were eight radio ballads in all, 
each dealing with a different aspect of working people's lives. When you take, a, take words apart, as I do on a, sometimes on a tape, but I have to, for technical and for other reasons, you find that, that even the I mean, vowels and consonants, this may sound right mystical, it's not really, are sort of vibrant with this mimesis, this oral mimesis, the, the entry into the experience that the speaker has captured at that moment. And you just, you can't misrepresent that. All you can do is try to honor it, try to, try to, try to um, release it in, a, in its most potent form. Hours of in-depth field recordings were painstakingly logged and analyzed. In the rhythms and speech patterns of the interviewees, McCull found the key to writing songs that wove seamlessly in and out of the actuality. Seeger provided the instrumental settings and directed the musicians, while Parker took responsibility for tape editing and studio production. We went in this boat, and that came on a gale of wind. That came down the Saturday night. And that blew for three or four days a living gale, and we were in these little boats. In 1959, the second ballad, Singing the Fishing, won the Prix Italia, the most coveted prize in radio. Singing the Fishing told the story of Britain's herring industry through the mouths of Sam Lana and Ronnie Balls, two fishermen who were given a media platform normally reserved for stars, entertainers and politicians. This is the BBC Home Service from the Midlands. We present Sam Lana of Winterton, up jumped the air and the king of the sea says D to the skipper, look under your lee, sinking windy old weather boys, stormy old weather boys. When the wind blow, we'll all go together. <laughs> and Ronnie Balls of Yarmouth in Singing the Fishing, a tribute to the fishing communities of East Anglia and of the Murray Firth whose livelihood has been the herring. If you fish for the herring, they rule your life. They swim at night. You've got to be out there at night waiting for them to swim. With our nets and gear, we're faring. Of course, it's a wonder, too, you see. You pick one of these little fish up, and it's vibrant with life. Brrr, like that. On the wild and a wasteful ocean. The numbers, you realize that there's only one of millions and millions and millions. When the little people swim up properly, they really do it. It's there on the deep that we harvest and reap our bread. There's no lazy man when hearing about it. As we hunt the bonny shows of heron. When you're doing well and catching fish, they talk to them all the time. Come on, spin up, my darlings, come on. And they absolutely cajole them into the nets. <laughs> 